Great, wonderful. So hello everybody. Uh, my name is Nasamir and I'm one of the editors uh, of the journal Identities, Global Studies in Culture and Power. I'm one of the directors uh, of RACED, a uh, cross-university network concerned with race, racialization and decolonial studies uh, at the University of Edinburgh. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this symposium, uh, which is also co-hosted with our colleagues in Critique, which is a hub for ethical and critical analysis, which draws together scholars from across the university. Before I hand over to my uh, co-editor of Identities and, and chair for this event, Dr. Aaron Winter from the University of East London, can I just say it's uh, especially um, welcome to host this discussion with Professor Robbie Shilliam and his book, uh, Decolonizing uh, Politics. Um, a number of colleagues at, at Edinburgh University um, have been asking uh, critical questions about the use of decoloniality in UK higher education in particular, uh, and what its adoption means more broadly uh, in the global north for understanding questions of, of knowledge uh, production uh, and how that's used. Um, and not least in our pages of identities, uh, which soon marks its 30th uh, anniversary and where our contributors um, have uh, contributed a, a, a really set of important um, um, commentaries. Um, Dr. Uh, Maria Barg, Dr. Uh, Apane, Apana uh, Davare, and Professor Tony Hastrup uh, have written uh, incredibly important responses in a dialogue um, with Professor Shilliam on this book, uh, on which I'll drop a link to during the course of, course of uh, proceedings. Um, if you can keep your um, microphones muted, um, but keep your cameras on, and then we'll open up the chat towards the uh, Q&A part of the discussion. Uh, we'll be recording this, as you can probably tell, um, and then we'll uh, share it um, after the event's finished. So I'm going to hand over to my uh, colleague now, uh, Dr. Aaron Winter. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending and participating. Um, I'd just like to start uh, by briefly um, introducing our um, our speakers, um, and then they'll each speak for 10 minutes, and then there'll be a Q&A as well as a, um, a discussion about the book, the responses, and um, the issues. Um, our first uh, speaker and the author of the book, Decolonizing Politics, is Professor Robbie Shilliam, a professor of international relations at Johns Hopkins University. He researches the political and intellectual complicities of colonialism and race in the global order. Um, he is both obviously the, or the author of Decolonizing Politics, as well as Decolonizing Politics, a response to reviewers, um, which he'll come back around at the end of this um, to respond to our speakers. Um, our other speakers, include um, Dr. Tony Hostrup, Senior Lecturer in International Politics at the University of Stirling. Her research broadly explores the nature of global power hierarchies between the global north and south in knowledge and practice. Unfortunately, um, Tony is unable to be here and will be missed and sends her apologies, and I will speak to some of her points and the wider review. Um, politics, not as usual. Um, the next speaker will be um, Dr. Aparna Devere, um, assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science Science, sorry, <clears throat> at the University of Hyderabad in India, and her current research uses non-Western political thinkers and concepts to interrogate dominant frameworks in international relations, and her review was Unpacking the Colonial Genealogies of Political Science. And finally, um, be Dr. Maria Barge, Associate Professor in the School of um, Maori Studies in Victoria University in Wellington, her research interests include uh, Maori politics, including constitutional change and representation, voting in local and general elections, and resource management economy. And her review was Decolonizing Politics with Insights from Indigenous Studies. And we will start now with Professor Robbie Shilliam. Thanks, Aaron. Um, good to see you. Um, uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, may maybe I'll, I'll just... I'll just give you five minutes of, um, of of where I am right now and and um, connect that to um, to the book. Um, it's good to hang out with Edinburgh Beach again. <laughs> it's good to see a partner. Um, so um, 
at, at the moment, I work in um, Johns Hopkins University. Um, and Hopkins has the um, distinction, if you like, um, along with Columbia University of being the the sites where the 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 discipline of political science was was formally um, uh, introduced and and developed um, and and here in the eighteen eighties we had a guy called Herbert Baxter Adams who um, held a a seminar the history and political science seminar um, history is now separate to political science but but back then um, it was together. Um, and Baxter Adams, like a lot of people, had this idea called germ theory, um, which, which is basically that the the genius um, and the competency for for being uh, 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 democratic citizens and 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 competently exercising one's democratic rights uh, have a particular racial genealogy. And they go back to the ancient Teutonic forests and then they come through England and then they end up in New England in the US. So Baxter Adams is famous for kind of positing that, that idea. He wasn't the only one. Um, um, there was a guy at uh, Wisconsin, uh, William Francis Allen, who was a contemporary and who taught Frederick Jackson Turner as a student, and you guys might know Frederick Jackson Turner as the, 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 the guy who comes up with the idea of the frontier as a big thesis for, for how it is that um, democracy ever renews itself by pushing into, in quotes, vacant land. Turner did his um, graduate studies at Hopkins, hung out with Baxter Adams and Woodrow Wilson, the famous um, political scientist then turned US president, um, did his graduate studies here um, and was influenced by Turner as well. I'm giving you all that um, to say that um, the formal instantiation of the field of, of political science um, was an inherently um, racist formation um, that understood democracy to be the inheritance of a few um, and all others who weren't Anglo-Saxon um, and property Anglo-Saxon, um, in, including women, would have to either be trained up uh, um, to, to, to develop those competencies always under suspicion, or would have to be quarantined in various ways from the democratic process. Um, but we've, we also have um, a, a long history um, here and elsewhere, of an understanding of the political process, which is anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist. And those gestate insights usually outside of the academy, although they sometimes gestate in the academy too, and in, and in, in various kind of relationships um, through and, 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 and to the academy. Um, and, and and nowadays at Hopkins, we're trying to put in place a kind of research theme on racial politics, which does not try to go outside of the discipline, but tries to actually reformulate the discipline to say, if you want to adequately study politics, you have to adequately understand the racialization of politics and the ways in which struggles over politics broadly speaking, are, 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 are struggles over, over that racialization. Um, so I'm, I'm going to leave it here. We can talk about disciplines um, in a little while, um, um, but I just wanted to, to kind of give that, that context. Um, I, Aaron, I don't know if that's enough just to begin with. I, don't, I, I wasn't planning to do anything more, so hopefully that's enough. <laughs> No, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, and you will um, you will get a chance to respond at the end. So, um, um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Maria Barge, um, who, due to um, time zone issues, um, is based in New Zealand. Um, 
is unable to be here. Um, so we have a recording of her talk. If we could set that up. Tēnā koutou katoa, he mihi mahana kia koutou. Ko Maria Baj tōku ingoa. Ano te awa me ngā te awa au, tēnā rā koutou. So internationally we know that calls are growing to decolonise numerous academic disciplines. Um, this isn't uh, particularly new, it's been occurring for a number of decades. And there are several strands to this literature. Decolonising is conceptualised in many different ways and what are seen as the essential elements also differs. Uh, so Robbie Shilliam's book, Decolonising Politics, adds a further really worthy contribution to this growing field. Uh, but I suggest it should be reflected on in the context uh, of insights about decolonising from Indigenous studies. So Indigenous studies scholars uh, have engaged in particularly intricate um, and long-winded potentially debates about the complexities of decolonising in settler colonies. Um, the nearly inextricable connection between decolonizing and the issue of uh, which are the best avenues and strategies whilst in the ongoing presence of settler colonialism is of crucial importance uh, to Indigenous scholars. Uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is where I'm based, the calls for decolonizing academic disciplines are gaining momentum. And this is spurred by a number of different factors, and including the, the long work, um, arduous work that Māori activists have done to have recognition of, of Māori rights, arising from Te Tiriti o Waitangi, which is the treaty that we have from 1840 between Māori and the British Crown. And that treaty really forms the basis of our unique liberal democracy. Um, and many of these discussions about decolonization come back to the idea of co-governance, in fact, between Māori and the self-determination or tenoranga tiritanga that was reaffirmed to Māori and the kāwanatanga um, that was allowed for the British Crown, the governance that was allowed for the, the British Crown. So that's really the basis from which we start this whole decolonizing discussion here in Aotearoa. In law faculties, we've seen a lot of um, comparisons with Canada and Australia, where Indigenous legal uh, scholars have really led the way in creating bi-jural and bicultural um, law faculties. And so here, Māori legal scholars are now calling for that same thing, bi-jural, bicultural, bilingual uh, law, law degrees um, within universities. And in fact, the New Zealand Council of Legal Education has accepted that, and now all law students in universities in Aotearoa need to learn about tikanga Māori as a first source of law. So there's a real recognition in the judiciary, uh, you know, that Māori law is, a, is the first source of law of the country and that all students uh, and lawyers and judges need to know this. So that's a really important um, step that we've made. Many of the Māori scholars, legal scholars in this area have pointed out that it's not good enough just to incorporate Māori law as a kind of cross-cultural competency, but it has to be revisioning uh, uh, teaching law uh, completely and a transfer of resources and decision-making power to Māori. Uh, so that's, that's all a key part of it. And these changes uh, and debates can present insights for other academic disciplines. Uh, for example, politics, uh, public policy, international relations in Aotearoa also need to learn from these insights. Uh, if tikanga is our first source of law and te tiriti is um, the foundation of our constitutional arrangements and our democracy, it seems to logically follow then that students of politics uh, should also be learning about tikanga Māori or Māori law to prepare them uh, for this new Aotearoa that we're um, continuing to build. So that's really um, important. The question of who leads the decolonizing has been raised by Indigenous scholars uh, who see that leadership role as importantly needing to be conducted uh, by Indigenous peoples. And this also reflects Indigenous scholars' uh, views on the very political nature of researching, writing uh, and teaching. Indigenous studies scholars tend to see the act of researching, writing and teaching as, as political. Uh, a textbook for students uh, of politics would be seen as very political in nature. 
the role of the scholar in the research and writing is pivotal in shaping a decolonizing world because uh, it can go either way, whether supporting ongoing uh, colonization or, or rejecting it or a bit of both. So that's where Indigenous scholars see you know, a really important focus. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, this practice of identifying one's positionality or identifying your genealogy and importantly, where you have obligations uh, and your place in the political ecosystem is a key feature of Māori cultural traditions. Without this identification, it's difficult to assess where someone else fits in the political ecosystem. Uh, so in Aotearoa and you know, not just in universities and, and Māori cultural settings, but it's commonplace for people to identify and acknowledge their ancestors. Uh, and there are a growing number of non-Māori uh, who identify themselves as Pākehā of European New Zealander descent or Tawiwi in fact, meaning from other shores um, uh, um, from around the world. And the positioning of oneself is not for blame or to uh, privilege or bestow a particular you know, emphasis on a, a specific identity, but it's rather more practical. Um, it's so that people have a sense of where you have obligations, uh, where you've received privilege, and where you literally sit on political matters. And most importantly, in order to be able to assess and build a relationship of the appropriate type with you. And relationships are central to Māori law, relationships amongst people um, and, and you know, humans, as well as relationships with the non-human world. So different aspects of the natural environment are also key. So one of the challenges I really found with Robbie Shilliam's book was the absence of that particular discussion. And of course, I met Shilliam uh, during his time at Victoria University of Wellington, you know a little bit about him, uh, but in some ways that's, that's com a, a completely different issue in the context of the, the book itself. The reader should be introduced to Shilliam as part of the subject matter, and particularly given the suggested aims of the book. Without overtly explaining the rationale for not addressing this aspect, uh, Shilliam takes the role of a somewhat hovering narrator a uh, somewhat neutral objective um, sitting, in, sitting in, the, uh, in the side there. And it's difficult to imagine that positionality and genealogy uh, were deemed insignificant to this topic of decolonizing, um, as each of the core chapters of the book involved tracing back dominant colonial thinkers and thinking to their origins and interrogating their place in a colonial history and disrupting their place. Similarly, those critiquing the dominant colonial views described as those on the margins were also contextualized within the political ecosystem. The identities of people and their context were clearly seen as important in understanding their place in the past and in the future of understanding and writing about political science, but not the narrator. So that was a, a slight um, uh, disjuncture there. So while it's commonplace in Indigenous studies to reflect on one's subject position in relation to the topic of research, it's also the case in a number of other disciplines, uh, including political science, social sciences and, and the humanities. So it's not unique in that particular aspect to Indigenous studies. This move to acknowledge one's positionality is replicated outside the University in Aotearoa, New Zealand, as I mentioned before, increasing numbers of, of non-Māori are talking about themselves as Pākehā or Tungata Tiriti, uh, which is a, a, a way of people are describing themselves to really highlight their willingness to be on a journey towards decolonising. And again, this is New Zealand specific in, in that it relates back to, to Tiriti or Waitangi, our, our founding um, treaty. It also has practical implications for research funding in an environment where the New Zealand government has introduced policies to support uh, Māori knowledge, mā tauranga, um, and, and knowledge, Māori knowledge systems more generally, and scholars. And so a lot of uh, people within the university and, and researchers outside are very attentive um, to knowledge production and Indigenous rights and how these things uh, fit together. So decolonisation is also about the change that communities and individuals need to make in their own lives alongside the change that we need, of course, in, in the academy. Uh, Shilliam hints at this in the last paragraphs of the book, 
with instructions, instructions for what readers should do next. However, the book itself could, in the way it was constructed, I suggest, have better enacted this. As I uh, mentioned earlier, I think the silence on the positionality of the author appeared inconsistent with the common trends to acknowledge the pivotal role of the scholar in writing um, or rewriting decolonization and the status quo. The position Shilliam took as an objective hovering narrator models the idea of a neutral guide, something which I think unfortunately lends itself easily back to the dominant practices and long-standing assumptions of colonization and the idea that a scholarly work can objectively describe the world as separate from oneself. Um, the second element of the Indigenous Studies scholarship to consider in relation to this book is the idea of centering Indigenous worldviews. Uh, the most effective ways to decolonize is always a difficult question, as people have different reasons for supporting decolonization. And we know Indigenous scholars have been writing back to the canon and disrupting academic uh, disciplines uh, for some time. And that was a key feature of much of post-colonial studies. But one of the theoretical decolonizing moves that scholars of Indigenous studies have made in the last two decades is to shift to simply reaffirming Indigenous worldviews. So beginning, uh, as I did, from a Māori worldview and context, uh, and then looking out at other things. So reaffirming Indigenous worldviews, methodologies, scholars as an act of reasserting what Māori call whanateretanga, our self-determination, but other Indigenous peoples um, describe with their own uh, terms. And really that's a, a particular project about centering Indigenous worldviews and therefore proliferating the stories about uh, Māori, in our case Māori, in the general sense Indigenous, uh, political thinkers um, and thinking and worldviews and really reaffirms bringing those worldviews into, into being. There are some parallels uh, with diverse economies, uh, community economies, literature, uh, where again, and they argue instead of writing more and more about capitalism, actually writing about the alternative community economies that we can already see in existence helps to bring those into being. So there are some parallels between those two, I think, political uh, projects. Uh, but the structuring of, of this particular book sits uneasily beside these moves to the centre given that Indigenous peoples here continue to be categorised as um, in the margins. It begins with by centering colonial thinkers, uh, providing critiques of those, um, dis providing, dis <laughs> providing critiques, sorry, from those who are described as on the margins. So despite the goal of disrupting the centre margins discourse and power dynamic, the structuring of the book reenacts the dynamic by reiterating it. So I think that's a, a real complication. The second implication from the structuring is that those on the margins tend to be categorized together, obscuring their differences, uh, which in the context of settler colonialism are quite profound. Tuck and Yang have argued uh, that homogenizing various experiences of oppression as colonization unhelpfully lends itself towards turning decolonization into a metaphor which ultimately undermines Indigenous people's aspirations for the actual return um, of land. So Decolonising Politics, this book, uh, presents plenty for students to consider and supports the large and small steps in many places to uh, decolonise academic disciplines. Uh, but I think key lessons from Indigenous studies will also provide useful prompts for students to consider alongside this work. Kia ora koutou. Yeah, so the, the next um, slide we have is for um, Dr. Tony Hastrup. Um, and as I said before, um, she's unable to be here. Um, so I'm gonna be um, attempting to kind of relay um, her points from the review, or some of them at least. Sorry. Um, now, her review was politics not as usual, um, and as she can't be here, um, and said I could relay her, her, her points, which include um, quotations, paraphrasing, and summarizing. I should say, though, that some of the review was based on an expressed Tony's own reflections 
on our education experience and intellectual development in IR. And that is really important to note as these points are coming through someone other than herself today. Um, so I, I hope I can do some justice to it. In the review, Tony sees, and to quote, decolonizing politics is both a reimagination of the discipline of political science, as well as a how-to manual for a decolonial politics with a focus specifically on West, the Western Academy. It is also, um, I would add a response and intervention, not just into those, these, but to the caricature of and a backlash against decolonizing. To quote, from the onset, Ravi Shilliam challenges a common attack of critics of decolonizing. Decolonizing politics is explicit in its aim to decolonize the mainstream knowledge about the discipline of political science, as much as the practice of politics. It boxes the idea of deletions to the mainstream canon. Rather, Shilliam shows us what is possible, emancipatory and inclusive, when the knowledge of the colonized are considered important enough for theory building. This is what drives decolonizing politics. For this, she highlights the fact that Shilliam starts the book with a biography of Aristotle, the father of political science and a child of empire, an immigrant and a contingent citizen of Greece. To quote, a new father of politics with depth and a context that forces us to consider the co of nature of lived experience and knowledge production it is important for two reasons. And I'm quoting. First, it counters critics of decolonization's claim that decolon decolonial knowledge is about the erasure of dead white men or some sort of canon. Rather, what Shilliam does, and as a counter to this false narrative, is to show us how we can rethink said white men and the said canon fully and in context. Second, and this is, is filters through the rest of the text, that the core assumptions held by those who we canonize, in this case, Aristotle as the father of politics, not only reproduces a very masculinized knowledge of the discipline, but also has implications for what we accept to be appropriate and important. By starting with a portrait of Aristotle that has been absent from the dominant narratives of political science, decolonizing politics calls for the discipline of politics identified by Shilliam in five sub areas, political theory, political behavior, comparative politics, and international relations to better contextualize our subject matter. In the comments about re Shilliam's rereading of the sub area of political theory, Tony discusses how he sets out to show the ways in which, to quote, the core concerns of political theorists, humanity, reason, and rights are imbued with racist assumptions that play out via colonial logics. Specifically Kant, as exemplary of the enlightenment assumptions that equate whiteness and civilization, as well as what it means to be human. Tony then looks at how Shilliam facilitates an encounter with the work of Sylvia Winter, who takes on the question of who is human, roundly challenging the idea that the white European man represented the epitome of the human. Such encounters, which Tony highlights throughout the review, run through the book. Tony's own reflections also run through the review. To quote, and I like this, this phrase, as a forever student of international relations, I was especially struck by the role of Woodrow Wilson, former president of the United States and venerated architect of the predecessor of the United Nations, the League of Nations. Unlike early IR education, we meet not Woodrow Wilson, the statesman who abhorred war, but another Wilson, the university administrator whose ideas about racial heredity perfectly demonstrates the co-conceitive nature of politics in practice and knowledge production. Tony also discusses and reflects on the colonial politics of development and IR and the relationship between these in and beyond uh, Shilliam's book, as well as thoughts on how these can be approached today and in the future. To quote, improvement, soon called development, starts out of colonial practice, which begs the question, what is development today? In a context where many of my, this is um, Tony speaking, students want to work in Africa or Asia for a development NGO, how do I break it to them? She continues, the critique of international development in particular is not new, though often argued via colonial logics. If corrupt administrators in former colonies cannot manage their development, the West especially should stop giving aid to such development. Such analysis, this is a quote, um, of course, elides the fact that the comparator of such development, the former colonizers, relied on the colonies for their development. 
which argues this is very well um, captured in Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and then states, I marvel at the fact that in my training on Africa-EU relations, for example, Rodney's work has never been a consideration. And she brings this out in her engagement with uh, Robbie's work. She continues, Shilliam's analysis of comparative politics does not so much resolve the implications of the colonial logics that are exposed, but what the book shows is that alternative centers of knowledge are possible for challenging hegemonic knowledge. In the same vein as Shilliam, I am arguing that without dislocating North America and European institutions as the center of knowledge, even when the subjects of such knowledge are in the post-colony, comparative politics will remain parochial. But, she asks, is IR any different? Noting that its inception, IR was founded on debates about imperial governance, as well as how it positions it itself as, the, as preoccupied with the grand questions of power, war, peace, even justice. The evolution of IR is perhaps the, most big, is the biggest indictment on the discipline. It is, she says, difficult to be optimistic about the state of global relations. Perhaps this is why realism is pessimism has been so accept, accept, accepted and acceptable. Although, maybe it's bad news, good news case, since, through, though since Chilliam acknowledges that IR has been the most open to decolonizing. And I think I'll, I'll leave it on that sort of positive note from Tony. Thank you. And then I will put my other hat on um, and turn, uh, to our next speaker, um, as uh, uh, Parna Devere. Um, let you speak for 10 minutes. Okay, if I go over 10 minutes, just feel free to cut me off. <laughs> I might need that time. Okay. So firstly, I wanna congratulate Robbie on the book. The depth, scale, and the richness of the book deserves much praise. Writing a book with this kind of breadth covering all the major disciplines of political, political science could not have been an easy task, and you have done it masterfully. So it was also much needed as political science has generally been a very conservative discipline, particularly in North America. So this is a subversive act in itself. And secondly, thanks for this great opportunity. I'm just delighted to be here. Robbie, you are someone who has really promoted collaborative research and encouraged scholars from all over the world with generosity and great openness. So I want to acknowledge that here. And in other words, decolonizing politics means something to you as a lived practice, something you talked about in your response. Anyone who has met and worked with you can attest to that. And thanks to Aaron and Mikala as well, who have been, you know, I've been exchanging so many emails with over the past several months. Thanks for your patience. So I, the comments that I offer today are really in the same spirit of friendship and collaboration. As a fellow traveler, I won't go into the details of the book since I already did that in my review. But my thoughts are more a kind of collective thinking, after all, we're all in this together, about negotiating our position as academics and yet trying to decolonize, as Robbie puts it, but slash with disciplines. So there is a tension that runs through the book. There's a kind of disciplinary training being introduced, you know, through the three R's, for instance, or as Robbie himself puts it, he's, uh, I quote, discipline the intellectual tradition of decolonizing, end quote. And yet the alternative voices that he introduces in the text, especially the women's anti-nuclear groups in the Pacific, Gloria and Zaldua, are so, and so on, are contrapuntal voices, to use Said's expression, to that act of disciplining decoloniality. So their presence is disruptive in many ways. In, by bringing them in, Robbie makes the book much richer, and yet they also force us to question the more academic voice in the book. So there are polyphonic voices in the text speaking in different conceptual registers that Robbie tries to reconcile. And this is a challenge as an academic, I mean, for all of us, because other modes of reasoning are going to necessarily take us in other directions. And to decolonize is to take these other modes seriously. So to my mind, Robbie's Black Pacific is a first-rate decolonial text. I know that Robbie's aware of this tension since he talks about it quite extensively in his response. And he responds by saying it is also imperative that we decolonize the disciplines. So while I do agree with that, and, and I wonder also if it's the location of where you are, where this becomes even more urgent and you, know, you feel that, um, that, that anger in a way, um, and I'll talk about this more in the Q&A, but I also wonder 
if we end up reaffirming the centrality of mainstream theories in doing so? Or can we just begin with alternative conceptualizations altogether? Could the book have begun with Gloria and the life worlds she comes from? Are we reaffirming a kind of chronology here that here's the core and then here are the margins that we need to take seriously? So since this is a teaching book, I raised that question. And I know I grapple with this even when I teach IR courses, especially IR theory, because the tendency is to start with the dominant theories followed by the critiques. And I'm usually rushing through the critiques um, at the end of the semester. So can I teach an IR theory course without realism, where I'm located? Realism, where most of the texts are written in the US by authors based there. It's even hard to find the books sometimes or they're too expensive rooted in US historical and geopolitical experiences far removed from the life experiences here. Definitely not where I'm located, would that be okay? Because especially in this part of the world, IR still continues to be largely about realism. But the same cannot be said in the North where post-colonial or dependency theory or third world experiences such as non-alignment, the new international economic order, Bandung, et cetera, will enter only some classrooms. So it seems like in this part of the world, we have to think through and against the mainstream and who's mainstream one may ask because most of the world's population is in the global south anyway, but that's not reciprocated. And there's also a political economy in which this is embedded. The North, particularly the US is where most of the resources are, the journals are housed, conferences take, take, take place, et cetera. So what does it mean when we say IR needs to be more inclusive? Given the material and structural constraints, can it really be? So a related point to this, which Robbie also raises about colonialism and the academy, is how do those of us located in post-colonial societies, where the disciplines and the modern university piggybacked relatively recently on European colonialism, the colonial rulers essentially set these up to train colonial administrators, negotiate these spaces. So in post-colonial societies, universities are not necessarily the primary or only spaces of creative thinking. There are many other such sites given that institutionalization and professionalization were relatively more recent trends historically. So maybe as Tony and Robbie agreed, we need to fo focus more on pedagogies and how to make these more meaningful and more connected to diverse lived experiences and plural ways of being. In the South, where, such as in where I'm located, many marginalized social groups who did not have access to higher education are entering the university system in public universities, thanks to what is known as reservation or what is also called what is affirmative action um, in the US, such as where I teach, making these important spaces of negotiating the coloniality of these sites. And yet, thanks to neoliberalism, just as new groups are entering these spaces, they are being undermined by aggressive privatization and the affluent are now being offered private universities. So these are creating new forms of inequalities and hierarchies. So Robbie's book has raised a lot of questions and provoked us further in thinking about decolonial, decolonizing politics. What are some of the directions we can go in? What does it mean to think of alternative conceptualizations? Is it about writing different theories or to theory itself? Are there other modes of being and living which have not prioritized theory or at least theory that is disconnected with actual living in the world? Uh, Vivek Dhareshwar argues that in the Indian or the South Asian context, there were always multiple sites of learning that permeated all aspects of sociality. And this cannot be separated from ethics and hence the absence of abstract ethical or moral theory as we know it in the West. So knowledge through these multiple sites of sociality, such as rituals, festivals, music, art, can only be experiential, constantly tested through experience. So words or concepts cannot be separated from the actions in which they're embedded or what he calls action theoretic concepts. And this is not necessarily unique to South Asia. So one has to ask why so many cultures have resisted theory as we know it today and focused on storytelling, narrative, lived experiences as a way to theorize or self-reflect. And they've been treated as cultures that lack theory or understanding. Is there a relationship between that kind of theoretical abstraction and violence? Uh, Shankar and Krishna has a piece titled Raised and Amnesia where he asks these kinds of questions. And there were strands of this kind of thinking in European thought too, but they were not dominant. So my last point is a, uh, is a question I wanted to ask Robbie, if, there were, if he thought there was anything distinctive about European colonialism, he mentions this in the response, but I was just curious to hear more since he talks generally about colonial logics in the book and you know, you also talk about uh, Greek colonization in the Greek city states. So I was just curious um, about that. But in the end, I just wanna say it's a wonderful book 
superbly researched and written and a great contribution to post-colonial politics. Always look forward to Robbie's books and the next one for sure. Keep doing what you're doing. Following this, um, we'd like to sort of invite back um, Robbie to comment and respond to the contributors. Um, the floor. Oh. oh, okay. Well, um, yeah, hold on. Let me just... Um, so, um, so I think, so, so let me just um, dwell on Apan and, and, and um, uh, Maria's um, comments, right? Because um, I've, I've, they kind of link up in a, in a way. Um, and, and, and one of them is about the place of disciplines, right? And, um, and um, whether one does this kind of work in disciplines, um, outside of them, um, reimagines re them. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, I, I wrote the book for, for students, mainly for students who are in um, less elite universities, um, predominantly, not only, but predominantly in the global north, um, as a as a resource by which if they if they were in hostile environments which they didn't which didn't allow them um, to uh, to deal with this material or, or 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 start dealing with the material, which which gave them some kind of resource by which to do that. Um, and, and I also wrote it for teachers who were in similar situations who might not command authority in their universities, might not have, have tenure or, or be senior, uh, might be adjunct, might not have the time um, to, 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 to research and, 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 and build curricula around this. So I wrote it for... for with, with that in mind, with the hope that other other constituencies would would get something out of it, um, and that's to my mind that's kind of important because there's there's a disjuncture between the kind of um, what's the word? The kind of resources and methodologies and, and protocols that, that Maria was talking about. Um, there's a distinction between those being written and published and the conditions and experiences which a lot of students who, who study politics actually exist in. Um, and Yeah, so even the idea of, I'm not convinced. So, I, I, I mean, it was wonderful to hear Maria talk about, you know, the, the, the developments in the legal field, for example. Um, it, 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 you know, the Maori studies people in New Zealand are, are incredibly, it, almost light years ahead in many ways. And as part of that struggle, they've managed to ensconce at least some of those principles in the academic space. And I'm not convinced that that those structures exist in the majority of academia, I'm just not. And part of that is to do with the way in which very serious issues like positioning yourself, so that people know your commitment, so that you're accountable. I'm not convinced that the academy and much of the academy actually has the provisions to honour that. And in fact, I think oftentimes it gets turned quite cancerously into um, call out politics, uh, uh, part of culture wars or, or just you know, liberal identity politics. 
So one of the things I want to put on the table is um, how do we seriously do that kind of work that Maria's talking about in conditions which are quite hostile towards them? That doesn't mean I'm not saying doing it. I'm just saying it's a, it's, it, it's a, it's a question. Um, where I am now in the US, for example, um, there is a tendency to fight um, academics as representatives of communities which they've just got no anchor in whatsoever, right? Um, and I'm very resistant to that, um, which is partly why people who know me and in other work and in non-academic work, I do the genealogy stuff, but I, I tend not to do it in, in this kind of work like that because I think it the, the, the critique is better than the, the consequences, which I think are actually really dismantling of, of, of a lot of the work. So I, I would want to put on the table, um, in a world where different places in different struggles have managed to develop less or more um, structures and protocols which affirm this kind of work, even if there are problems with, with, with inequality still, in that, on that kind of uneven terrain, um, how do we have conversations and how do we put in effect pedagogies which acknowledge that unevenness? So that's one of the things that I, about, I wanna put on the table in terms of taking those arguments really seriously, really seriously. Um, and, and it kind of links to Apana's question about about the disciplines and decolonizing i mean my, most of my work is probably just un, undisciplined and not i don't mean that in a kind of clever way i just mean literally like i bumbled along man and and um and the last before i came to the us actually but what i have seen happen is um is that disciplines get a free ride and when you put everything in the studied stuff everything in the applied stuff everything in the interdisciplinary space and all the cool work happens there the disciplines which by and large still get the key budget budgetary resources which by and large still command all the hierarchies and and and, and distinctions in the academy um they get a free ride and is it the case that no one ever talked about rights except for, you know, the, the European political theorists? Well, no. Um, so part of part of this work I see um, as actually um, becoming a little bit dirty, if you like, by disciplines, because that, that's that's how power reproduces itself. And to also disaggregate, at least in principle, if if not kind of like in substance, the different kinds of work that we do in different spaces, um, and 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 what is required in some spaces is not the same as what is required in other spaces. I don't want to give the disciplines a free ride. I just don't. It doesn't mean to say that you know all my stuff is about disciplines, <laughs> and I always start with Woodrow Wilson because I know right. But it's a, it's it, it it it's it's about you know. Um, being basically um, on the one in one way, as as Apana said, you know, complicit, right? Um, uh, but but you know, I'm a I'm a full tenured prof in an R1 university. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's not it's it's I like I am complicit. I do other work as well, but I am complicit in that if that makes sense so part of it is working within the complicity as well as well as work doing other projects which 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 don't operate in those spaces Aparna, help me man because I, 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 your comments were, were, were talking a bit about that no i agree with you and i think that what you said i think about the, the question about location also matters to some extent because you know as a graduate student in in dc when I would try to bring up some of these issues of colonialism and, you know, and I would just be told by my, some of my IR professors that, oh, go off to anthropology or go to 
go to um, go to development studies why you and IR like these are not issues that you should be talking about or bringing up in IR they don't belong in IR so that that anger or that feeling that you you know you don't have a, you don't belong there you're sort of you should be somewhere else with the other third world folks doing all the third world things that people do so I so I so if I you know if I had a book like yours at that point it would definitely have helped me. So I think what you're saying about that you're writing for students in a particular location, I think that there is something to be said about that. Um, I think from where I am located, maybe there would be less anger or the or less sort of frustration at wanting to do this because even though people still read the same text, this this seem a bit distant, you know, and they seem like okay, some old white guy saying something, you know, it's it's not as you know, it doesn't provoke the same kind of response, I think, among students who can still, they can still sort of gauge that this is something about, you know, that doesn't necessarily relate. Um, even if there is, even if it's a colonial society, there's still some of, of that distance. So, yeah. so I think location, I think bringing up the location and where you're located and who you're writing for in the audience, I think that is an important point that you're raising. And I can mm. I can see that I, I, I do. Um, but, but that links to your question about what's distinct about your European yeah, colonialism, yeah, because yeah. Um, I, I would I would I would imagine that in some locations, um, like like, are you going to talk about Rudyard Kipling when you're talking about Mona? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, who would, who's more important to talk about? Do you get what I mean? So, like, I, I think there is an element of that where, um, and certainly what I see in, 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 in at least some of the, 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 the Global North Academy is a, um, some places, not all, but in some places, an assumption that, um, this is going to be valuable material to go through these 18th, 19th century thinkers, um, you know, or histories, um, when in many ways, somewhere like India has had three, at least three post-colonial iterations of governance now. Do you know what I mean? And where the debate is as much within those post-colonial iterations as it is with pre-48 or whatever. Do, do you get what I mean? I, I don't know. Tell, tell me if I'm wrong. No, I agree. I agree with. I agree with that. Um, but, but what does that do for? What does that do then for, for? For when we're trying to do this work together, what does that? What does that mean? What's the consequence of that? Yeah. So, so I guess what I was trying to, you know, the question that I raised about European colonialism was because I was wondering in the book you, you talk a lot about colonial logics, right? So, what did mm. you? mind when you were talking about colonial logics did you have like what did what was you know what did you think about when you were thinking about colonial logic so was it specifically scientific reason or were you thinking about colonialism in general about just domination and oppression or you know? logics of irreducible segregation and hierarchy with nothing mutable about them um lo lo logics which then oftentimes, are, which are not authored by Europeans, by the way, but logics which then can um, tease out and raise to a particular significance that they might not have been otherwise latent or, or even activated similar logics in different spheres, right? Such, such, such that the logics of coloniality regardless of the skin color, regardless of how many iterations of post-colonial rule, always, always redound back to politics of, of irreducible segregation and immutable hierarchies. That, no, that's for me. Yeah. Colonial. Right, I get that. But I, I just like the, the kind of genocidal violence that you see with European colonialism. Mm. Is Precedented, and there is, like, to my mind, I feel there is something that distinguishes it from the colonial colonialisms that came before. And yes. so, that's going on there, and it has something to do with science. Anyway, so that's that's what I was trying to get at. Things. Yeah, yeah. See, I'm in two minds about that, Napana. Right. Yeah. On the one hand, there's an empirical claim 
mm -hmm. right? Which um, probably on a global scale, I would I would agree with, right? Um, um, more important for me would be simply what what's the shadow that we live under right now, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, uh, rather than because you know it can often become a competition about about who was the best and who was the worst which doesn't really lead us to an actual anti-colonial politics, right? Um, but then on the other hand, um, it's about, to me, what, how did the conceptual, cosmological and practical space get so cleared, right, of any other um, alternatives or any other um, mitigation of of those 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 logics of violence, right? And I think there's there's something in in the I, I would say the 1400s actually, which really puts this in place, and before 1492, and which um, which then becomes the the means by which similar logics get brought up and start to clear spaces in different ways in different places, right? Um, and I think a lot of that is the, is, is the idea of, is the combination of um, plantation um, moving through the Mediterranean from Cyprus out to Madeira, then to Sao Tome, then across to Brazil, then by the late 19th century, to India and now Indonesia and and then in eighteen hundreds Fiji, Queensland, um, uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, tree plantations. That logic of clearance, right, and extraction, connected to a cosmology of apocalypse, meaning uncovering, not the end, but the uncovering of the of of all humans under one plan. Right, and that was a Catholic thing, but it was also an Orthodox thing. It was also a Muslim thing at the time. It, the the fourteen hundreds of this era of just apoc uh, you know, apocalyptic thinking, such that it justifies all that clearance and extraction, right, um, and, and death, on the basis of well, this is all about folding all of humanity into the master plan for the final for the final revelation. So if I was going to, you know, if you're going to push me about what would be distinct about it, I would say it would be that. Yeah. And then secularize. You know, a lot into kind of you know, providence and liberalism and then, and then ultimately political economy. That's right, capitalism. Thank you. This is just a brief question. It's not a good question. But um, Robbie, thank you for explaining your logics of colonialism. That's really helpful for me, right? This bringing of humanity under one umbrella, as it were, the apocalyptic thinking. That I think that's a distinctive starting point that makes a lot of sense. But that's not my question. My question is a very practical one and a self-interested one. So what happens? I don't know whether uh, other people here have this uh, issue, but in your response to Maria, Robbie, you talked about how the spaces that you're writing for are very distinctive from the one that she is coming from, right? What happens for spaces in flux, which is what I find myself, right? Where there are students who want, you know, who come with these other life worlds um, and, you know, are refusing, you know, sort of don't see the value in, the, in, the, in decolonizing the discipline, right? Want to bypass the discipline all along. Mm. And the class is a very mixed space. And so the contestation is very much about that, right? And it's not articulated yeah. very clearly in those, right? But it's almost mm -hmm. like a lot of the energy is going in that. And so people really don't get a sense of, at least from my place, from being an instructor, it just seems like people are talking past each other and you know there doesn't seem to be a lot of focused conversation, right? Uh, and- Yeah, just, so, just explain a bit more, man. They're, they're, they're... What, how, are, how are they talking past each other? I think there are some people who want, right, who understand uh, very much, who want to 
work within the discipline, right, and to decenter the margins, right, and who are responsive to that, but with the kinds of tools, right, very disciplinary tools. And there are others who, um, right, who want to engage more, say, in storytelling or, right, or yeah. sort of very kinds of, right, other okay. kinds of modes of engagement, right. And sometimes that extends to, as you said, seeing other people in the class uh, or themselves as representatives of communities also, right, which then adds a kind of um, a layer to the classroom discussion where people are very, sometimes very afraid to talk because they don't want to represent other people, right. And so it's sort of, it's this kind of mixed space, right? And so I don't know whether anybody has had this kinds of uh, right interaction. So I was just wondering how people have negotiated that. That's that's it. Thank you for mm. your forbearance. No, man. I, I yeah. I mean, it's that's a really important. I mean, I actually find that less with students and more with fellow <laughs> academics. <laughs> to be honest, right? Um, yeah, um, and I. I, um, I mean, one of the things to clarify, right, is, you know, when I was listening to Maria, she's talking about a, um, a, a struggle, a Maori struggle, you know, o over decades and centuries from the from the you know, from the, the treaty onwards, which has now eventuated in some. Um, what's the word, um, formal um, and, um, um, what's the word, not legal, but um, but anyway, some formal structuring of intellectual space. Do you get what I mean? And, and so it, it's, it's an incredible learning process to just to see that, right? Um, but I wanted to say it's, it's miles away from a lot of other spaces. And I don't mean that badly, I just mean, like it, it's not just casual talk. Do you get what I mean? And, um, and, and, and I think in a lot of other places, we just, we're nowhere near that formalization. The best we've got is diversity and inclusion, which we all know how badly that can go right. Do you get what I mean? It's just, just window dressing most of the time. Right? So with, 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 that, with that said, then I think that, um, we, we, we're in spaces which are quite unstructured for this kind of work, or they're structured for a very different um, purpose. And then we're trying to unstructure them and restructure them. And within that, there is no linear thing. So if I said they're miles away, miles, light years ahead, in a way they are, but, but they're from their own from their own situation, you get what I mean? So it's like, we're all in the same time in different, with different trajectories and different inheritances, which are, which are connecting, but they're still, they still manifest quite distinctly, right? They got some cogents when they manifest, right? So I, I, I would see that, yeah, I mean, like, look, hold on, hold on. Um, to my desk. So one is one is Rastafari and other African Caribbean worldviews. One is Hans Morgenthau political biography. <laughs> so, like in other words, and and in fact, we had a Rastafari summer school last year where we taught Joe Nye soft power because it was it was useful. It didn't make us realists, but it was useful. But anyway, um, so. So what I'm saying is, is that these things are actually that there's a reason why they're operating at the same time, and there's a reason why, you know, we it's kind of like braided. We we kind of cross over, go out, cross over, go out. Do you get what I mean? So sometimes I'm into the poet stuff, and other times I'm I'm reading Hans Morgenthau. Do you get what I mean? And there's no, it's not our identities. You know what I mean? That's often what Errol Henderson will say. Henderson will say when when it comes to positivism, it's like your identity. You you, you got know I me. Mean? So I think it's a willingness to have that simultaneity. Do you know what I mean? And then, um, and then, and then with, with with the forbearance that right now I'm like, you know, why isn't anybody dealing with Hans Morgenthau? Next week I'll be like, fuck Hans Morgenthau. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> and then the week after, I'll be like, why is there? Do you see what I mean? It's not, it, 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 this isn't apocalypse. I'm not, I'm not being, you know, convert. Do you get what I mean? All of that then is to say this is there's a this simultaneity is because of the structure and the unstructuredness, right? And the way in which we're scrambling along like that, at least in academic spaces. I know we all connect to other spaces too, right? And and long may that continue, you know, if we're working under these structures which weren't designed for that. We in fact were designed to actually mitigate them conversations. So I, it's a bad answer. Apana is going to be able to answer it way better. Oh, father. <laughs> there we are, what? No, Narayan and I have had this conversation, so... Uh, Is it? Okay. Um, Do you find that in where you teach? Sorry? Do you find that where you teach? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think Is so. It? I mean, I think that's... I think that tension, like you said, it's part of the academic world. They were like, you know, it's something deeper that we're dealing with. You know, that... Um, I do you not. Know, I definitely do um, find that tension. But um, like I said, I think the the desire to to move beyond that is also pretty strong. And to find other ways of expression, yeah. uh, possibly more where I am now is stronger. Yeah. The relatability perspective. The relatable one stuff. Yeah. 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 No, but I then there's always the practical side of it too. Like there's always that. You have to live in, in the world and be practical. All those things also come into the picture. Yeah. Yeah. Great to see you, Robbie. Yeah. That's Hitchin. No, Hitchin. No, where is it that you was living? Uh, yeah, Hitchin. Yeah. That's Hitchin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, great. Uh, great discussion. I suppose I was, as you were talking, I suppose it's that issue, like you were mentioning, around power you know mm. that you're now at john mm. hopkins so actually then mm. thus having the power to kind of be in a top ranking institution in a sense i suppose my question is in a sense what are the benefits and the pitfalls because in a way i suppose the issues that we're dealing with around decolonizing mm. speaking from the margins in a way, when you're in the margins, <laughs> some, somehow, in inverted commas, you're deemed to have a more authentic voice. Yeah. <laughs> you're speaking to these issues and concerns. Yeah. But you actually don't have much power <laughs> yeah. to affect the change. Yeah. So yeah. in a way, when you move then into the more powerful spaces and yeah. you're still wrestling with those issues, in a sense, yeah, I suppose, what are the advantages and the, and the disadvantages, would you say, of kind of being in the institutional space where you actually have resource and a bit of power, still and speaking to the questions of marginality, and, and then in a sense, what become the disadvantages? Because in a way, are you then seen as, again, mm. are you really still speaking for those places, for the margins? Are we supposed to be deconstructing and destroying <laughs> these spaces? Yeah. Because these have been the spaces that have been so damaging to our experiences yeah. and to our communities yep yep no i get you man um yeah i mean it, I'm, so i'd say the first thing i mean i don't know man some of the twitter stuff gets me a little bit annoyed because it, it, it it's kind of virtue signaling and it's like, like from what i can see Maybe I'm wrong, but from what I can see, the actual term decolonizing, which is a different genealogy to decolonial, if totally different, right? But the, not totally, but significantly different. The, the genealogy of decolonizing comes out of post-colonial elites, right? Elite, or elites around independence on the African continent, especially Kenya, right? A set of colonies, where they're trying to figure out, you know, what where does this process end and what needs to be drawn up in this process what institutions need to be drawn into this process in order for it to be actual decolonize, decolonization it's a continuous action verb decolonizing right so this was an elite conversation 
right? Let's be clear. It was about, it was about, are the churches, can you, can you worship a white Jesus in, a, in an independent African country? That, that was one of the debates. You know, the, the, obviously about the imperial division of labor was another one of the debates, right? The, the academy was a massive other one. Are we just going to train, um, train up um, students to go and live in the urban areas and get a, get a bureaucratic salary and, 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 and forget the rural areas? Yeah, is, is that what education is? Is, is, is that a decolonized education? So the first thing to say right, is, that, and, and is that the decolonizing thing, to my, to, from how I see it, gets, gets a real um, coalesces around the 1960s, principally, but not only on the African continent, around intellectuals like us, <laughs> you know what I mean? in various positions of, of, of institutional power, less or more, right? Trying to figure out where does this thing end and, 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 and what is our accountability in, 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 in doing, doing this work? Do we just benefit from it or do we benefit from it with various elements just left in place? So let's be honest about that. Let's be honest about that. You know, other movements have their own concepts and their own words, right? And they're usually a, a fair bit more radical. Right, Land and Freedom Party in Kenya was was one. Right? You know, I mean? it's no surprise that Gugiwa Thiongo ends up getting kicked out of Kenya because he writes a novel which basically says that the post-colonial elite are worse than the, uh, not worse, but they 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 they've got nothing on the Land and Freedom Party. He gets kicked out of of you know, uh, 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 moist moist Kenya, and then he goes and he right he goes and he presents his decolonizing the mind series of lectures at Auckland University in New Zealand. Right, uh, so, um, so that's the first thing to say. Right, let's be honest, and, and we don't need to have that anxiety, if, if that makes sense. Right, because we don't. The anxiety is misplaced, and it takes up the air. Right, it takes up the air, and it also skews where we should be putting our energy and what accountabilities we should be holding. Right, which are often quite unglorious, and that's and that's the second point. The second point is that. Um, When, if you occupy a position of relative power, because you know, like you, every, you, everybody knows, you think you get in the inner sanctum, there's another door to another inner sanctum. Do you know what I mean? There's always another door to another inner sanctum, right? But anyway, when you're in some kind of position of, of, of institutional power, you've got a duty to do something with that space, right? However complicated or complicit that might look, you've got a duty to do that because otherwise all you do is sign it, silence, right? But here's the other thing. You also have the responsibility to do a whole lot of work, which you will never narrate on the CV, right? And, and, and which does not get counted, which should not get counted, which is mundane quotidian work, right? Which is not even, you know, leading a, a charge or anything like that. And it's to make the institutions where you're in porous. So even if the top of power is solid, there is some porousness underneath that, by which you can do the undercommoning stuff, you know, the, the, the Stefano, Honey, and Fred Moten stuff, or, or however you feel you, you should do it, right? We, um, and, and we have here in Baltimore, what's called a Bol the Baltimore School, which is a, a, a school of thought, which is all about that, which is about saying that, a, a good part of the work that you must do is not to be written in books, is not to be, you know, discussed in detail. It's not, it's not like conspiratorial. It's just that every time you, you narrate that work from a position of power, you become, you become the politics because that's who people have access to. And there's a, a terrible, uh, what's the word? Um, 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 libidinal economy <laughs> in that, right? Where, you know, people always like, ah, oh, Black Lives Matter. We spoke to ex-Black scholar, you know, an ex, you know, um, privileged institution. Like, it's, it's okay. And they're really cool, don't get me wrong. But it's like, you shouldn't be talking to them. But it's just an easy way, easy thing to talk to. Do, do you see what I mean? And then the flip side of that is that the more that you write that stuff, I mean, you know, you're talking about, 
you know, people coming at you with violence. So the more careful you have to be as well, right? So a lot of this is about the unhumbleness of, 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 of these undertakings. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, William, but it's just that, you, you know, it's that kind of unhumbleness working to, to, to working to at least attempt some kind of horizontal, ethical, co-constitutive, co-interdependent um, um, kind of working with, 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 with intellectual and, and political communities, which you have to do the work with. I, I don't know. How does I mean? How do you do that? Because I, I mean, you do all these incredible, like transatlantic dialogues. How, 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 how have you found that, man? Working with all the faith communities and all that. Yeah, let me not <laughs> take up all the conversation, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's it's complex. But like you say, I think in a way, it is taking that cognizance that a lot of the people that we consider revolutionary leaders in the decolonists they were elites <laughs> weren't they you know relatively powerless in terms of the power structure but within their communities having power and voice and perhaps it's going back to kind of learning the lessons the good and the bad about mm -hmm. how they utilized their power to to pursue these agendas so like you say, I, I agree with you, it, it, it is complex, but mm -hmm. we kind of have to work through that complexity, staying grounded with our communities, but also kind of advancing in the spaces where we are, trying to facilitate some kind of progressive change, realising, yeah, that those structures are difficult <laughs> to break down and, that, and they can't be broken without those people from below putting pressure on those systems to affect that change. Yeah, I mean, I've got no, I have absolutely no um, illusions about the fact that what we do in the institutions is, is soften them up in a good way. Um, but institutions never lead to change. People pay a, a hell of a bigger price for that outside of the institution. Yep. So dear, so dear, ah! Are you, are you a proper Mancunian now? <laughs> I'll leave you to judge from my accent, uh, probably not. <laughs> Hi Robbie, really good to, to see you Hello. and uh, thank you for this fantastic talk. Um, I was just, uh, you know, as someone who's now in the US, it doesn't have to worry about the problems of the UK. Um, but I'm sure you the know the UK. Is, yeah. <laughs> well, no, well, I'm, well, I mean, I'm sure you um, uh, remember the UK and can see the UK from where you are now, and and remember specifically, you know, um, the study of politics here in the UK and British politics if I might speak to uh, the area where I work and it's very you know as has been said uh, it's very conservative it's very um, uh, we we have our focuses we know what we do um, there's it goes back a long way and um, and I was just wondering what your thoughts are on how kind of decolonization and kind of this kind of a project that you are a advocate for how it moves from the from the kind of margins into the mainstream and how it kind of you know it's not a question of we um you know I'm there's sorry. a certain level of accommodation but actually it doesn't really threaten or challenge you know the mainstream and how we continue to reproduce publish and teach students year after year you know the ins and outs of how we do things here and i just thought that you know, there's clearly something going on, and and there's a kind of a wave of sorts. But yeah. what you know, being at the kind of you know, what are your opinions on where this goes and how it's going? I'd really like to hear more about that. Mm. I mean, um, I, I'm, I, I guess I would simply say, Sadia, that 
in the UK context, it, it begins and ends with the prevent agenda. If, if, if all the decolonizing stuff is not actually targeting the prevent agenda, it's not decolonizing much. So prevent agenda is the most fascistic intervention in universities in a long, long time. And there's all other kinds of politics, right wing populist politics linked up to it. You know, and, and, and you know, pe people who suffer from the prevent agenda usually don't suffer, or by and large, uh, uh, more people who suffer from the prevent agenda aren't going to be in the big Russell Group universities, but all the very worthy decolonizing stuff is being pushed. And I, 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 you know, I know them. They're wonderful, wonderful, awesome people. It's not about the individuals, it's about the structure. So, I mean, I, what do you think, Sandy? <laughs> Um, I just think that, I mean, I think you're absolutely right about the prevent agenda. Um, and I think it's, um, as you know, I think those of us who do that daily interaction with students can see um, the kind of real implications of that kind of, um, uh, the, the kind of insecurity it leads to for students. Um, but I would say that I think that, you know, um, I have lots of friends reading this book and I have lots of people who I know will never pick this book up for, and you know, good people, lots of good people who will, are very comfortable and confident about what they teach and how they teach. And I, and I just wonder what the, you know, um, what the scope is for, for, ha for having mm. a kind of a, a conversation where everyone engages rather than just the people who you know, tend to care about these kinds of issues. Yeah, yeah. It's a great point, and I don't think there ever will be that conversation. I don't think there ever has been that conversation. I mean, like, what well, did, did that happen with feminism? No. Nope. <laughs> so, like, I, 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 yeah, it just it, it won't happen. I think the issue is, I think it's an intergenerational issue as well, Sadie. Yeah. I think it's about, um, you know, those, those those who feel in one way or another a necessity to engage with this kind of stuff where the institutions, the structures of the institutions won't, won't actually um, provide for that conversation. You know, where even if they're forced to, but they won't, you know what I mean? So, and again, that speaks to the very, to the quite different, you know, academic context in different places where that is slightly more than in some places than others, but all of the places have some kind of issue. You know, like, like when I was in New Zealand, there were some very cool people in my politics department, um, but the, the the space between them and Māori studies was huge. And Māori is a, a political scientist as well as Māori studies, and she studies stuff, you know, electoral politics. She does, the, you know, the bread and butter, man. You know what I mean? But from Māori studies, right? Um, and the first conference, well, when it was in two thousand and seven, um, this New Zealand Political Science Association conference. They had a whole, um, you know, plenary with all these people talking about when did New Zealand independence begin, and not one of them mentioned the Treaty of Waitangi. Could we? Um, we've also got a question uh, that was posted. Mm. If, um, we have a little more time from Vivek, um, and I'll just I'll read it out. Um, my question is on the theme of logic and emphasis within political science, and by extension, the humanities and social sciences on rational thinking of humans, which is the dominant Anglo-American worldview. In most other worldviews, the ideas go beyond rational thinking, human-centric itself, to work for peace, for instance, by including animals and other living creatures in their daily ways. The Jain tradition, oh, sorry, of Ahimsa or uh, Ubuntu being some such strands. How can such instances be used to dismantle the dominant logic and emphasis on reasoning, realism, and other such structures? Mm. Vivek, tell us more. Vivek, Celine. Vivek. Have we found hey, Vivek. Uh, oh, Vivek, brilliant. 
Hey. All right, tell us more, Vivek. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm not too sure what uh, could be possibly ways of including such things, but I was thinking of like, yeah, uh, maybe including courses on ethics uh, and including such strands uh, at the undergraduate level of uh, studies and things and then sort of extending it into uh, the larger idea of international relations and how it functions. So that's one possibility. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Aparna, you're doing that kind of stuff. T tell us what you're doing with that or, that, or the relation, relation, relationality stuff. Yeah, I mean, those are things that many of us are working on, I think, right? In this, a lot of post-colonial scholars are trying to work within this um, domain of alternative conceptualizations, right? So you're looking at different ideas. Of, so you try to move beyond ideas of security, order, um, you know, the convent VIR uh, concepts, and you try to, to push that and look at different ideas of, of community, generosity, friendship, um, sovereignty, plural ways of being sovereign. So trying to reconceptualize uh, some of these things through the different um, life experiences and worldviews um, around the world. So definitely, I think that's where post-colonial scholarship is going, right? It has been going in that direction for a while now. And it's, it's created a lot of spaces, I think, for people to work in these areas and to really push, I think, um, to think about other ways of being and living, right? So I think that's a, it's, it's been, it's, it's a good thing. I mean, from the time that I was a graduate student to where we are now, I think we have, um, we have moved quite a bit in those, in those directions. Nessa, you, you, you were going to ask me something, right? Uh, I was, I was going <clears> to <throat> study the debate by asking you a theory question, but, um, there are far too many people who are cooler than me on this call, and we've actually run out. We've run over time. I mean, oh. I'll, I'll I'll pitch it briefly. Aaron, is that all right? Is, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I really enjoyed the conversation you and Aparna were having earlier in response to Maria's provocation, mm. and um, kind of your, your answer to some extent to Maria is is about you know thinking outwards from from a given context, which is what I like so much about Maria's intervention. I mean, it kind of pushed you and prodded you, but she was, you know, speaking from, um, she was educating, I think, the rest of us, certainly people like me, from 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 her kind of um, social and political context. And, and it's a great deal to, to learn in, in reversing the telescope like that, which is what yeah. I always understood, the decolonial as a kind of epistemic, I suppose, approach to, to be about. So, so when I bought your book, I, I thought you were going to, actually start to some extent with people like Mills. And that's partly because I'm, you know, just trying to, uh, and I have been for the last couple of years kind of struggling to make sense of kind of where, where you take Mills. Um, but given that you're in the US and, you know, the very basis of a lot of um, thinking around racial justice is about that colonial uh, settlement, um, about the ways in which Mills obviously argued that, you know, liberal democracies are at, um, are at core, you know, domi um, um, sites of domination contracts, you know, the racial contract in his terms, um, and kind of gives you this very clear elaboration about things like the fundamental constitutions of, of Carolina in, in 1669 and, you know, through, through um, Hobbes and then to some extent Locke as well. So I, I thought you were going to kind of begin with that because that then gives you a, a way to tell a story about the relationship between the colonial, between race and then prospectively, you know, something which is decolonial, but from an American context. But but you you don't mention Mills at all. You you haven't got a single reference to him in your uh, mm -hmm. bibliography. I was really surprised because I thought you were going to kind of elaborate on that point and mm -hmm. talk through how actually you know race to some extent has this role in determining what the colonial was, even though if that changed the idea of race through the process. But in a way, you kind of flip it and you say, well, look. There is a political um, development within what we're calling the colonial, and that's what then populates a, 
uh, prevailing idea of race. And, and to some extent, you kind of said that as well in, in the talk, talking about from 1492, something changes, mm. you know. Well, um, before, in, but yeah. Yeah, something uh, something changes yeah. in categorization, then then in process. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, th those are my thoughts, just to carry on the conversation thanks you're already having with the point. So, yeah, no, no, thanks, man. And, and I mean, you, you, you're thinking that I was going to do more than I did. <laughs> No, I'm just being honest. It, it, like it was, like who in political science reads Charles Mills? I, I don't mean our little bubbles. I mean in general, who in philosophy reads Charles Mills? Very few people. Which political science graduate program teaches Charles Mills? You get what I'm saying? It, so I, I. I I, I was taking political science at its face value. Where does it say it starts? You know, what are its subfields? And let's go from there. That was all I was doing. And and and, and I, mean, I don't mean that braggingly. I'm, I really mean that was all I was doing because the, the, the principal aim of the book, and it's not the decolonizing agenda per se, but the, the aim of the book was to actually say to political science as a discipline, you know, to, or to give people the resources to start to think, if you take political science as a discipline seriously, can you not think about these things? Rather than, well, we, I'm going to do a course and it's going to be called colonialism, race and whatever, and I'm going to get all these wonderful thinkers on it. I mean, I've, I've done those courses, you know, I'm like, I'm not dissing it. Yeah, and we're going to, do you get what I mean? I've done them here in my graduate courses. And at the end of it, I've been thinking, did I let political science off the hook? You know, for, for, for graduates who might end up becoming political science professors. It's not the whole thing. It's just part of it. But like I was saying, you know, if you've got a position of authority, relative authority, you know, it's not an either or, but part of your work has got to be hold, holding that thing to account. It's not the whole of your existence. It's not the whole of your accountability, but it is part of it. No, no, absolutely. And, you, and I don't think you let political science off the hook at all. Uh, no, I'm saying, in, and I'm saying when I did my grad courses, I do think that sometimes. I honestly do. Because then they're not going to do public opinion surveys. But, you know, like, like what I was trying to say with that political behaviour chapter is that the whole idea of public opinion and why yeah. you would survey is all to do with a distrust of the racial composition of the populace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much for that. Aaron, back, back, back to you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, sorry to say we've run out of time, but I'm pleased to say that we've had so many great questions and discussions that we've gone over. Um, but I want to thank everyone um, for participating in the symposium, uh, Robbie for the great book, and for everyone um, taking yeah, part in this you. discussion and for all the questions. So thank you very much, and um, I hope we can continue this discussion. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks, oh, Apana, thank you. Um, uh, Tony, Maria. Thanks, Aaron, Nessa. <laughs> Thanks, Mikaela. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All Thanks, right. everybody. Take <laughs> care. Thanks. 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 Thanks.